Good evening. So does everybody feel like you're sitting like about four inches lower? Yeah. Oh. First of all, blame your husband. Secondly, they're actually comfortable enough that I'm kind of worried that and I wanted them to be a little less comfortable. Third of all, when we do get our new church, prayerfully this year, they go with us. Woo, they're ours. We own them. Fourth of all, if you don't want to blame your husband, blame Crystal. It went from Crystal to Jay to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks to the people that showed up with about a 30-minute response time to help us out. And Justin Stark showed up with his three youngest children. And they outworked all of us. Did they not, Jay? They were phenomenal. Little cheeks red, sweating. They were hauling. They were awesome. So, anyway. They were hauling stuff. Man. John. John, control our congregation. Elder John. You're so, you're so smart. That's why you're an elder. All right. <clears throat> So, I'm glad to hear that um, Joan and Richard are back with heat. Woo-hoo. And I didn't expect to see little Eden back already. Um, there's been a counseling, and uh, we don't have results on everything that could be wrong, but they're feeling hopeful that it's some simple things, but we don't know yet. This little child, has in, in a 20-minute time span, has up chucked her food up to 18 times in, in two hours. Uh, she has a really, really, they just don't know what's causing it. So that's why she's been in Columbus getting checked out, and I'm sure there's going to be some more trips. So continue, please, to lift up Eden. Um, please continue to lift up Carol and uh, her whole family. And uh, Sierra's grandmother is doing wonderful. So just to keep you guys posted on that. I was going to talk to Tim today, and I had things going on in the church and did not get to call him. Uh, Laura's doing great. Tim, I haven't heard. The last thing I heard was, I mean, he's stable. It's not like he's in the hospital, but you know all the health problems that Tim has. And he's had some really bad virus on top of that, and it has hit him really hard. I won't give any more information than that, but he's, it takes a lot to make Tim go down. And so he's, he's not been doing well. So those of you that can, give him a call, check in on him, see if you can do anything for him, because uh, he's the first one. When I was in uh, Cleveland, he drove all the way up just to spend the day with me. He, he's the first one to always show up. So if you can, give him a holler and see, see how he's doing and if he needs anything. Um, do you guys have any special announcements other than that? I know we don't usually do it on Wednesdays. Just want to see if it's anything pressing. Men's meeting uh, Monday was phenomenal. And much appreciated to all who came. Very unusual meeting and awesome awesome meeting. We all sat around a table for communion and there were 12 of us, so it was biblically perfect. So, <laughs> I'm wondering which one's going to stab me in the back today. Yeah. Avery did? For the first time in almost three years? Now, how old, Avery's like nine now, right? And she hasn't been to school since she was five or six. Oh my goodness. So they both got to go back. So is her sister older? Wow, that's precious. All right, good deal. Uh, I want to also lift up, uh, put the names out there, and I ask you guys, lift them up. Take prayer time so serious. Uh, David Robertson, Mike Spencer, Jim Gabehart, Linda Painter, Cecil Wilkes, and Marva Ledbetter. Haven't heard anything from Marva yet. She got her test this week, but it's going to take a while for them to get back. But uh, if you'll stand with me, we'll open in prayer, and we'll jump in. And y'all are just old fogies that don't like change. Just give us a couple of weeks, and you're going to love our chairs. <laughs> and if you don't, I'm going to play the Zeshawn video over and over that shows them sitting on each other's legs in the floor and having a good time worshiping. No guilt needed. You know what? It's a no-win situation. Because if I do, you're going to fuss at me as a nurse. And if I don't, you're going to make fun of me. So. Wow. Wow. 
There was a pastor that I just heard this week that said he loved talking to the camera only because he didn't get heckled. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm beginning to feel it. So, all right. Thank you guys very much for being here. Wednesday nights have, have just become uh, a wonderful, sweet crew, and I appreciate you guys getting out here. All right? Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we just we come to you now. Lord, help us all put everything away. Not one other thought in our mind. You're the God of the universe who has put us first. Help us now. Stop everything. And through your spirit, through the help of your spirit, put you first. I ask you, Lord, just help us to be your servant. Help us to be where you are tonight. Hear what you have to say. Apply it to our hearts. And help us, Lord, through the spirit to just draw near, sing from our souls. In communion with you, being one with you. And Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters to you first, starting with our sweet little Eden. And Lord, you have brought Maddie and Eden and Dakota through so much. And they, through your power, stayed so faithful and trusting to you. And I ask you, Lord, give Maddie and Dakota emotional strength and give them peace and give them trust in you. And I pray that we find out what's going on very quickly. And I pray you'd put your hand on this little girl and she wouldn't even have to be touched. And Lord, I lift up Avery just in praise to you. The, the so much that you've brought that family through. We praise your name for all you've done and we ask your continued blessings. And Lord, for everyone on our list that we just mentioned by name, I ask, Lord, that you move in their life. I know that you hear our prayers. We claim the name of Jesus Christ. We claim the blood of Jesus Christ. I ask you to move in their life physically. But more than that even, Lord, emotionally, spiritually, draw them to you. Let them see and hear what you want them to see and hear. And let them glorify you where they are. And then, Lord, touch them. And I lift up my brother, Tim Hudnell. And I pray, I ask you, Lord, even as we speak now to you. That you would move on him physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And give him strength. Give him healing. Have him back soon. And Lord, everything that's happening, we thank you for the chairs that we have and the wonderful opportunity. Lord, I ask you for the building that we're working so hard to get into. It's just the building. I just ask you from the bottom of my heart that it be done in your time. But more than anything else, that, that it be done because we hear your voice and because it's done in a way that you are honored, that you are glorified, and we know that it was your hand that moved that caused it all. Because, Lord, we know this is our church, the people here. And I ask for this church, my brothers and sisters, I ask you to protect us, keep us in unity, keep every heart here humble and passionate for you. I pray, Lord, you'd use us more. Pray you'd let us find your will more. Let us step out more. In Jesus Christ's precious name. And they all said, Amen. Amen.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. How awesome, how deep. How foolproof in showing that you are the creator and showing that you are the author. God is now with your Holy Spirit. Help, help the word to go deep into our hearts and let it make change, starting with me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> no children's church. It's already going on. They're having a ball down there. All right. Uh, we are in chapter 13. Got, there we go. <clears throat> this guy's so perfect. I'm telling you. I had to use him. I'm jealous of him, but I had to use him. All right. <clears throat> this is why I love walking through scriptures. I have read the story of Samson a number of times. You guys have heard it in Sunday school how many times in your life? If you never heard any other story, you know songs about him. Uh, in studying this and spending the time Boy, God shown me some things already. I'm just loving it. So we're going to jump right in. Uh, we read the very first verse in chapter... Th John, why are you staring at that so hard? It's what you'd look like if you let yours grow out. I can tell it's that thick. <laughs> All right. Uh, we read the very first verse of chapter 13. So we're going to jump right in, and we're only going to do the one uh, chapter. And we honestly should be done right about time or a little early, but I'm not going to guarantee it. Here we of uh, the Philistines for 40 years, one of the longest periods they've been under control by anybody. And the Philistines are some tough peeps. And I, I'm, I'm not going to go through it. We spent almost all of the second half of last week giving you details about them. Some of you were not here, so I'm just going to throw out the skeleton. Uh, but we needed to know because we're going to deal with them so much from this point on. They were powerful seafaring people, almost like the Vikings. Okay, They came in from southern Europe and the Greece area. And uh, they settled in along the southwest coast, okay, about the time the Israelites were coming out of Egypt from bondage, okay? And so they were getting established when the Israelites hit the scene. So they, and they're, they both came from other areas. Now, these are real pictures of things that have been dug up from the Philistines. They developed the technology of iron. They could, they could sh smelt, 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 and uh, forge iron well before anyone else in the area. So that gave them an agricultural uh, advantage. That gave them advantage on equipment. And it especially gave them an advantage on what? Military. Because they could do iron chariots and swords and spears. So they were way ahead of everybody. Okay, now... Uh, this is where Samson comes from. He's from the tribe of Dan. And uh, he comes from a city called Zorah. And he's the last judge in this book. But there are a couple of more judges we'll cover in 1 Samuel. But he's the last one in this book. And there's a lot of time given to him. And there's a reason. Now, how many of you remember stories about Samson from Sunday school? And to me, he was, I mean, if you're a Christian little boy, Samson's Superman. He's the biblical hero that you can just be all excited about. Nah. He's more like Deadpool, if you're into uh, heroes. He's the anti-hero. He's, he's the guy that screwed up in every way conceivable, and God used him anyway. So I can kind of relate to this guy, but he's not standing there in his blue tights and a red cape. He's, he's got issues, okay? He's a very complex character, and it's going to be so awesome and intense studying him all right and we're just going to get in basically his childhood even though he failed so much God still used him powerfully and we're going to learn some of the reason why tonight so we're going to jump on in and we're going to hit it and I have allergies terrible so I'm going to be sneezing and snorting and it won't just be because I'm crying all right here we go we got we made it to verse two are you ready we're going to go faster all right now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. Uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now I want to stop right there for just a second. Manoah and his wife appear to be um, 
part of the small group that actually still followed God like they should at that time. And you know, if a woman was barren at that time, it was the end of everything. Lineage and, and ownership of land to the Hebrews was everything. So the women had the key to the world. When they had children, they had a heritage, and they could pass that land on given by God. It was everything to them. And when they were told they were barren, it was the end of the world. So this uh, angel of the Lord comes, and because they've held true in their faith to Yahweh, he's going to use them and reward them for their faithfulness and grant them a special child. All right, now... News of this gift from God, and this is, I got to cover this every time because it's so awesome. There's so much involved here, and it's going to be a special reason you need to know it. Came from a messenger called the angel of the Lord. Not an angel, not a named angel, the angel of the Lord. We've seen it how many times now? About four times, five times in the Old Testament, we've seen this. What, here's what I want you to see. We know from previous times, and I've shown you, it's just unmistakable. But this time it's so cool. And you need to see it because it's going to bear into the story. This is, again, a Christophany. And as we go into the story and you learn more about this angel, it will become absolutely 100% apparent. I won't have to try to make a case for you. But I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler. That's Jesus. It's not just an angel of the Lord. Okay, In a pre-incarnate Yes, this is before he came and was born on the earth. But he made appearances all through the Old Testament um, in a human form. This is one of them. And we're getting ready to show you why as we go into this birth. All right, here we go. Verse 4, if you listen, say amen. All right. Now, therefore, verse 4, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Sounds like Christmas, doesn't it? And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Now, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time here, but we're going to park here for just a minute. We had to understand the Philistines. Ten times more, we need to understand what a Nazarite is. A lot of people get it confused with other things in the Bible. And if, even if they don't get it confused, they don't know what it is. So, the child they were going to bear and raise was to be a Nazarite from birth. It's going to play into everything about Samson. You've got to know exactly what a Nazarite is and what's expected of him. Okay? So we're going to take a few minutes here. Nazarite is different from Nazarene. And people get those confused all the time. You hear people say, Jesus the Nazarite. Do what? <coughs> yes. So I'm going to show you what the two differences are. Nazarite is spelled two different ways, two different ways correctly. So if you're spelled differently in the Bible than you see it up here, it's going to mean the same thing. All right? Nazarene simply means you're from a certain geographical location. It's where you were born or it's where you're from. If you're from the town of Nazareth, you're a Nazarene. Jesus was born, I mean, was raised in Nazareth, so he was Jesus of Nazareth, and that made him a Nazarene. Okay, now, a Nazarite, on the other hand, this was a long time ago, especially as slow as we go. But in number six, we covered it. So I'm only going to cover the highlights. Nazarite stems from uh, the Hebrew word nazir, meaning to separate or consecrate. This is big, okay? A Nazarite could be any Israelite, male or female, okay? That what they did, they gave a voluntary. This was always voluntary, except for the exception like we're going to see today. It was a voluntary vow given to God. And... It was a dedication to God during this time. It was for a set period of time. If you took a Nazarite vow, you were giving yourself over to complete holiness, righteousness, and sanctification. You were setting yourself apart. Nazir, what did I tell you it means? Separate or consecrate. So you're setting yourself apart for God in a very special way. Kind of like when we fast for a day and you're staying away from foods and you're trying to focus only on God. Well, this was a big vow like that. Now could be for any length of time. Usually it was a few weeks to the, the average thing they would do would be a month. But it could be months, years, whatever. It was established by the person, not by God. Now, you could enter into a Nazarite vow for some of these reasons for your own. You could give thanks to God for a blessing. I'm just so thankful for what you did. I, I want to have a Nazarite vow to just give myself to you, completely to you and no one else for a while. Uh, if you were delivered from a difficult time and you wanted to praise God for it. Uh, after the birth of a child, especially one you didn't think you were going to have. 
to just show passion and love for God. I'm just so in love with you, God, I just want to show it. Okay, these are reasons you can fast also, by the way. Uh, to show repentance of a sin. Um, not to get forgiveness of that sin, but to just show God your heart. To show dedication to a task or a calling. These are reasons you might take a Nazarite vow. Now, there's five basic steps. Well, there's three basic steps, but then you've got the beginning and the end that have to be done, right? So there's five basic guidelines and steps. We're going to cover them because it's going to help you to make a lot of sense of everything that happens through the whole story of Samson. And it'll only take us just a second. So the first thing is you have to, number 6-2, Make the formal swearing of the oath. Lord, I come to you. Here is my reason. Here is what I vow to you. Here is how long I vow it. And this is why I'm doing it. And you, you basically start by consecrating yourself to God with the vow. Okay? Step number two, uh, you have to abstain from, and I won't go back and read the whole chapter to you because it's a lot in it. But here is the outline. Okay? First thing is you abstain from wine or any other fermented drink. And you abstain from vinegar from grape juice, from raisins, from anything that looks in any way, shape, form, or fashion that could ever be alcohol. You just stay away from it, okay? And that was to keep you uh, from being in a lot of social atmospheres and obviously from getting the joy of having alcohol because you are to abstain from the world, even abstain from these social pleasures because you during this time would be totally focused on nothing but God. I'm not going out to eat with you. I'm not going to have a good time. I'm not going to watch TV. I'm all about God right now. That's basically why they were doing it. Make sense? All right. Because remember, they didn't have grape juice. Grape juice lasted about as long as you could set grape juice on your counter. They had wine, and that was all they had. So if you weren't having wine, you were having water. That was pretty much it. Okay. Now, so that was the first thing. Second thing, I don't have a problem with this. I'm in a permanent vow. You don't cut your hair. Okay. <laughs> Hmm. I take a new vow every day. <laughs> All right. And you don't cut your, your hair. That's number six, five for the duration of the whole vow. It was a sign to the world that I am set apart for God during this time. Listen close. I'm trusting in God's will and God's way, and I'm walking in God's strength. And the, the hair was a visible sign that you were set apart, and it was a visible sign of how long you had been doing it, Right? My vow has been very short, just a few minutes ago. So now that gives you a little hint as to why Samson's strength was in his hair. And you see why I'm so wimpy. All right. Next, they were not to touch or go near a dead body, not a human dead body, not an animal, not anything. OK, if a family member died while they're in a Nazarite vow, they can't have anything to do with it. They just have to say, sorry, mom. Bro, go, go give my condolences because they, they can't have anything to do with it. And that's just to say, I am set apart uh, to the incorruptible one right now. Death shows the corruption that sin brought. And it's again showing symbolism that I recognize with my God and I'm showing to the people. I can't have anything to do with corruption right now. I'm seeking the incorruptible one. Make sense again? So those are the three, blah, 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 blah. Those are the three things. The fermented drink, the hair, and not touching any, any dead thing. I want you to remember that. Now, after that's all done and they've ended their vow, they have to do it properly. And I'm going to tell you what. We went through all the sacrifices and offerings back when we were going through Exodus, Leviticus. I don't think there's one that they miss. At the end of this vow, this vow was so expensive that poorer people that really felt led to do a Nazarite vow actually had people to sponsor them to help them pay for their ending offering. It was such a big deal. Okay? It wasn't to be taken lightly. So at the end, they would go to the door of the tabernacle if they were close enough to travel to it. Sometimes they couldn't. But if they could go, they'd go to the door of the tabernacle. They would offer one male lamb as a burnt offering. Listen to these offerings. Those of you that were with me during this time, you'll see how many we hit. One male lamb for a burnt offering. One female lamb for a sin offering. So we got a burnt offering, sin offering. That was the beaten by the priest. Then one ram as a peace offering, which was, that's a kind of a fellowship thing between them and God. And the family would eat part of that one be before the presence of God. Then they would offer unleavened bread and wine, which was a grain and a drink offering. So you got burnt offering, sin offering, peace offering, grain offering, drink offering, right? And then at the temple door, they were to shave their head, 
take the hair from their head. And during the time that the peace offering was being burned, they were to put their hair in the fire of the peace offering. It was the fellowship. That was the big fellowship offering with God. What that did was the hair length symbolized their sacrifice of time. This is how long I've done this, right? So that's showing the sacrifice of their time, how long they've been consecrated. It's thrown into the fire and it's burned up as well. Then after you do all that, they offer a wave offering. And uh, at the end of that, then whatever else they promise to God, some people promise even more for different things they're going to do or give, then you're to give that. If you've got anything left after that, that's awesome. But this is like they're hitting every single thing they could hit. So it's a big deal. Uh, there's only three times in Scripture that the Nazarite vow wasn't just given by choice for a set period. Three times in all the Old and the New Testament. Wow, is it that boring in there? Who's doing it? Joan, you're the only one looking down. <laughs> I love you. Hey, at least it wasn't my phone this time. So I'm always happy it's somebody else. You could get a different ringtone at church, though, because that really plays bad on me. Just say it. Richard told you to do it because I was talking smack to him before the service. So. At the end of the vow, it doesn't specify. We would have to go into the Talmud probably to see what they did historically. I would say they probably cut their hair to a certain length, maybe back up to where they started from. That is not in stone. Because I asked the same question and I went to a lot of sites and I could not find an answer. So my thought is they probably cut the hair back to where it started. If you do a permanent vow, it's not in scripture. Since you brought it up, I'll go ahead and say this. Such as Samson. He was a lifetime Nazarite, right? So where would his hair get to? So it's not in scriptures, but the Talmud says, the Mishnah, that those who took a lifetime vow as a Nazarite, they were allowed to cut a certain amount of hair that was approved by the priests once a year. So you grow your hair the whole year and you could cut a certain amount off, but it had to stay a certain length to show. So I would assume traditionally at least that the women would be doing the same thing because you wouldn't want to cause one problem while doing something else. And if a woman shaved her head and her head is her glory, right? So I think they would just cut it back to the length with which they started the vow. If we find out different, I'll let you know. I did try to find the answer to that, but I couldn't get it. All right. <clears throat> Good question. Now, um, in the Old Testament, it was Samson and Samuel. Those were the two lifetime Nazarites. Okay? In the New Testament, who was it, guys? Come on. John the Baptist. Lifetime Nazarite. All right? Now, they spent their entire lives consecrated to God, and it started in the womb. And Paul actually made a Nazarite vow in the book of Acts. I want you to listen closely. It goes that far forward. And that confuses you because we say, hey, he's not under the law. Right? Acts 18, 18. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. There's only one vow that makes you take your, cut your hair at the end. Okay? Now, he didn't do it to keep the Mosaic law. Just like when he got Timothy as, as one of his disciples, he didn't get Timothy to be uh, circumcised to keep the law. But what he was doing, he said, we're going to the Jews. We're going to minister to the Jews. We don't want to walk in being an offense to them, be all things to all people, as long as it's not taking away from the story of Christ, right? So he took that vow. If you go back and read it, it actually explains it in Acts. He took that vow. He got Timothy to be circumcised just so he wouldn't be offensive to the Jews who were Orthodox that he was going to try and witness to. But so you actually see a vow all the way up into the New Testament. Uh, now, this is so cool. Um, it says Samson will begin to deliver Israel, obviously, because we know he won't finish it. But this is what I studied, and I'm sure that I could find someone out there, if I studied enough scholars, that will talk about this. No one has, but it's so, so, so apparent, and it was so awesome that I just want to bring this out, and I think that you're going to see what I'm talking about. All the other judges, and if we don't get any further than this, it's okay, but all the other judges... Uh, it's kind of the same pattern, same pattern, same pattern. Samson comes along and everything changes. He becomes a lifetime Nazarite. That's a really big change from what he did with any of the other judges, right? Does God do anything by accident? 
If something changes in Scripture, and it's a very blatant and open change, is God trying to tell us something? Does he waste a page of Scripture? No. So you've got to stop and say, what was God doing here? And on top of that, he takes the most sacred vow that any judge could take. He actually consecrates himself physically, openly to the public, in front of the world, to God, and says, I give you my everything. I'm going to be your righteous, holy person for life. Guess who screwed up more than any other judge? Nightmare, right? So number one, why did he become a Nazarite? Because no one else had to. Number two, why did God cause him to be the Nazarite when he was the biggest screw-up and would make the biggest fool of the whole situation? Well, stop and think about this. This is what I believe with all my heart. Compare, this is the last time that a judge delivers them, right? Compare Samson to the nation of Israel. And who's God trying to jerk a knot in? Who's God trying to use everything as a picture and an illustration and, and a design to teach and grow Israel? It's God. All right. Samson starts by being consecrated and set apart while even still in the womb, right? But he had parents that were barren. They weren't going to have children. Their lineage was going to stop and there was no hope. Go back. Israel, before they ever were birthed as a nation, were in Egypt and their future was barren and gone and lost. They didn't have a lineage. They weren't going to be a nation. They had no way out, right? God birthed them. God said, I, he promised before they ever left Egypt, I anoint you. You are mine before you are even born as a nation. You are mine. You will be specially anointed. I will deliver my people with you. Are you with me so far? So even before they were born, they were anointed. Israel. All right. Um, Israel, its whole time, God said, I set you apart. God said, I make you holy. You aren't deserving. I did it before you were a nation. I made you a nation. I made you holy. You're specially anointed. You're powerful because of me, right? But what did Israel, the most blessed and righteous nation, anointed nation of God in the whole world, who looked worse to God than anybody? Who screwed up in every conceivable fashion? Who was full of lust and greed and hatred and unforgiveness and rebelled and did their own thing even though they were anointed? Israel. Okay, Samson was given to a barren family who had no future. Samson was anointed and sold. You will be raised up to save my people. And you will be anointed even before you're born. And then he took that anointing. He was the special, the chosen one. Like Israel was the chosen nation. And he screwed up in every conceivable way. Israel had no enemy that could not be defeated on the outside. Because God always did crazy things. Did he not? But they fell apart because they fell from the inside. Samson was too powerful to be beaten by anyone on the outside. Why did he fall? Because he fell inside in his righteousness to God. And every single thing. And then catch this. God used him anyway because he said, I've anointed you and set you apart and I will use you. Right? He used him to free the people anyway. But because Samson fell in his own sin, it cost him and everyone in his life dearly. But God still said, I anointed you, and for my name I will use you to save my people. What happened with Israel? Israel fell apart, but he said, I've chosen you. I will use you anyway. But it cost Israel greatly because they sinned against him repeatedly. Do you see the complete parallel? It's a complete parallel. Samson was set apart just like Israel. He was the chosen one, and he fell, and he let God down in every way, just like Israel. But he still used Samson. And he still used Israel. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. God's word is awesome. And it's. We'll get to that. <laughs> you are exactly right. No. Give her a high five. Give her a high five. You are awesome. Did everybody get that? People out there didn't get it. Crystal, the keeper of the seats. Said, and Samson's death redeemed all the people. He sacrificed himself in the end to save the people. So all I can say about that is booyah. Very well done. All right. Now, where in the world did I leave off? I got so far into that. Okay, here we go. 
Now, verse 5. Boy, this is, I just take too long. But how do you get through this fast? Verse 5. For behold, thank you, Crystal, that was awesome. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save and deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So the woman came, the wife, and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now, she didn't ask him his name. He didn't tell, but she said, I really didn't have to because he was so awesome. I kind of knew. Okay. Uh, she was told not to eat or drink anything while pregnant. Why? Because if you eat or drink something while pregnant, it's going to touch the baby from the inside. And he was considered anointed and filled with the Spirit as a Nazarite from his conception. The whole time she carried him, she wasn't separating herself and not drinking and not eating for her, but because there was an individual person inside of her that couldn't be touched by what she ate or drank. So if you have any doubt as to when God calls you a person, you need to just go read this one scripture. Uh, I understand the world getting confused. I understand the world going where they're going. If they don't know God, they don't believe in God. But if you call yourself a Christian, you cannot read scriptures like this and stand anywhere near saying it's okay to have abortion. Those people have made mistakes just like we have. And many of us have made that mistake inside the house of God. You love them. You go on. God forgives and you love yourself. But you don't call a sin okay just to make someone feel good. And verses like this show you, if God said, woman, don't do it because that, that guy is my guy. That guy that was just conceived. So you don't put anything in you that's going to touch him because it ain't about you. It's about him. Same thing. If you're not in danger and that child is there, it ain't about you. The child is there now. It's about them. So I won't go on with it. But you see where God stands on this with verses like this. All right. End of story. And we as Christians need to understand that if you don't believe in God, can you not understand why people make the argument they do? I, I know why they do. It's dead flat wrong, but if you have no morals, no God, yes, I understand. And I understand it's done by a lot of people that are ignorant of the truth, and they're young and they're scared. I understand. Not all of them. Some of them do it blatantly, horribly, on purpose. But that is just one more sin in the world and as horrible as it is, we do everything we can to stop it. But you love and embrace those people and say, you are just as loved by God as it, I've done things just as bad. Both of our hearts are just as dark. You don't put those people in a special category. You don't put anybody in a special category. You love them. But you don't back off from the truth because you're scared to politically hurt someone because it's the hot button right now. You stand firm wherever, wherever it takes you. But you better stand firm in love. Because God stands firm with you in love. So, enough said there. We're going to move on. Verse 8. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman again. So Manoah says, God, could you come back? We didn't get all that. And she, the angel comes back to his wife. He's still left out. Oh, God. So the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Then the woman ran in haste, told her husband, and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Manoah rose, followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And his answer is, I am. So just, that's just nice, but it's not the proof. Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? He's like, this guy's going to be so special. Tell me, where does he need to work? Where does he need to go to school? Uh, how do we need to fix his hair? What does he need to wear? He wants to know, hey, this guy's special. Tell me how to take care of him. <clears throat> so the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So the angel came back because Manoah asked, in sincere faith, he's like, I believe you, I'm excited. 
Now tell me, give me details. What do I need to do? The angel came back, I think, in response to his great faith. But notice that the angel absolutely didn't answer one question he asked. What did he do? He just repeated exactly what he repeated the previous time. Do you know what he was saying? I'm going to honor your faith. I'm here to show you because you didn't doubt me and you really are interested. But my answer is going to tell you this. It's not for you to know. You need to walk with me and let me reveal it as it happens. And I promise you it's not a cop out. With all of my heart, you will get that answer from God. And he will mean it with all of his heart. And he's doing it to grow you close to him. He's doing it to make you trust him, to make you walk without fear, in peace and love, even when you don't understand, to test and grow your faith. And he would rather get in the car with you and give you directions than to give you a map and let you leave him standing on the curb at the gas station. And if all you do is rattle his cage for information and drive off into the sunset because you say, I got this. God's like, hey, you see why I didn't want to tell you? Or you turn the car around and you go home because once you get the whole plan, you're like, I'm done. I'm sure that would have happened with me on that great faithful day in May 22nd, 2005. But now I wouldn't go back for anything. But I am telling you, when you ask and God doesn't give you the whole answer, yes, there might be times that you asked wrong, inappropriate for yourself. But if you know you're searching with all your heart and you're asking, and you're just not getting an answer. And believe me, I understand you just say, thank you, God. I will trust you. I will walk with you. Because it's a very real answer with a very real reason. And it's the number one greatest time you can ever show your faith in God is real. I hope that makes sense. And we can see it happening all the way back in the book of Judges. And you just hold on because that's God telling you, you just buckle up. I'm going to ride with you. And you just take that to the bank. And you understand that it's true. It's not some pretty little sermon to make you feel good. He's that real. And he loves you that much. And you're that important to him. And he wants to walk with you. So. <clears throat> sometimes it's the only answer you're going to get. Verse 15. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord. Please let us detain you. And we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah. Though you detain me. I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering. You must offer it. To the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. So the first kind of declaration of the angel. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Of his true identity. He says I'm not going to eat your food. But if you're going to prepare anything. It has to be a sacrifice unto God. Okay. Uh, I am. Now it gets bigger. But that's the start. Verse 17. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord. What is your name? That when your words come to pass. Guys this is so sweet it will break your heart. What is your name so that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. Now, the angel said, don't, don't ask me my name. It's wonderful. The Hebrew word here is peli. Okay? And you can go look it up. It, it means two things. Uh, are you, stop, look, listen. It means secret and wonderful, awesome, great. Okay? Secret. Why would you say that? It means secret and wonderful. It's a wonderful secret. Tell me, what is the only name in heaven that at this point in mankind's history would be secret and wonderful? Uh, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He said, my name is secret and my name is wonderful. I've already got my answer. How about you? There's even more. But just, mm, God's word's awesome. Almost done. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, offered it upon the rock to the Lord. He did a wondrous thing. He, the angel, did a wondrous thing. And if you go and look at King James Bible where it, it capitalizes every time Jesus or God is mentioned. Every pronoun is capitalized because they obviously understand the truth of this passage. He, the angel, did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up towards heaven from the altar. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar 
When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. And when the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. So after everything else happened, uh, he openly states, dead gum, honey. We did. That was God. That's pretty blatant, don't you think? Okay. I don't think he quite said it like that. That's a translation. Um, now, I'm going to stop and pause right here, and I want you to drink this in. Because I've read this story before, and I've never stopped to consider this. Okay? If you listen, say Jesus, please. All right. Is it not awesome? What? Who? What was that? Okay. <laughs> All right, ponder this. Are you ready? I'm, when you realize that the angel of the Lord was who? Jesus. How awesome is it that Jesus came to announce the miraculous birth of a child that would be anointed at conception, that would save his people from the sins of control and suppression? Jesus came and announced the birth, the miraculous birth, of one anointed at conception that would save his people. How crazy awesome is God? Think about that story. Think what's going through Jesus' head when he's doing it, knowing that his birth would be announced, and he would be. You see how this story's parallel? You see how everything about Samson parallels Jesus Christ? Jesus is announcing this child that you have is miraculously conceived and will be anointed at birth, and he will save his people. Blows my mind. But the problem is, Samson was a little different. He was only a human child, and he would openly and sadly show that he was just that, very human. Uh, and all his faults that would follow him, God would use him, and now we kind of get an idea why. But his wife said to him, if the Lord, listen to what she says, every word in this paragraph. If the Lord had desired to kill us, what did she call the angel? Openly, the Lord. He would not have accepted a burnt offering. Who accepted it? The angel. And a grain offering from our hands. Nor would he have shown us all these things. Who showed them? Nor would he have told us such things as these as this time. So we see, obviously, those are the nails in the coffin. She's just calling it outright. So the woman bore a son, called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him in Mahane Dan, between Zorah and Ishtaol. Now, um, early in the life of Samson, it says, between Zorah and Ishtaol, the Spirit was already working. I don't know whether it was working, giving him his desire to free them from the Philistines, or whether it was working to show his strength and his power and his courage and his might. I think that he was beginning to see and feel that power from the Spirit, uh, because when he came across a lion, he knew what he could do the very first time. And uh, Samson's an illustration very clearly. And this is what I'm going to close with. This is the thought I want you to have, okay? Of how we can be filled and we can be walking with God. And then in an instant we can fall, we can succumb to our own desires and sins. Sometimes it's when Satan hits you the hardest. You get on top of the mountain and you're all happy, you're all excited, you're all confident how you're walking with God and then he knocks your feet out from money. You ever been there? I'll tell you I have. Sometimes, sometimes Christians who seem to be walking with God in their highest mountaintop fall quicker. And that's the truth. I think sometimes being on the mountain is one of the most dangerous places to be. Uh, because you grow in your pride and in your accomplishments and in your blessings and in the recognition that's coming and, and you just you drop your guard. Listen to this. Samson was destined to be used of God before birth, right? And then he fell into sin. But God used him anyway because... God had a plan. And God said, I'll use your failures in my sovereignty. And I will still have my way. Now it's going to cost you horribly. But I'll still have my way. Um, and it wrecked Samson's life. 
this is 110% true, and, and the sooner you get this, the sooner your Christian life will take off. Okay? Some people have been taxiing the runway for 20 years now. Excuse me. God does have a plan for your life. Absolutely. Every single person in here. Psalm 139, 16. I'll read it to you again for some of you listening for the first time. Your eyes, God, saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. That all comes together, man's choice and God's sovereignty. Every day of your life was formed in his book, and he let you make every choice you want to make. But he's omniscient. And he will take your mistakes, and he will still have his way. But you still get to make your own choices. And it depends on how he will use your life as to whether you choose to walk with him, be intimate with him, serve him, love him, be one with him, or whether he has to use your mistakes and your mess to do his will anyway. But he's going to, as sovereign God, be triumphant in the end. Uh, I've seen, and we've seen guys in the ministry, uh, Gideon, he was at his peak God was using him, and then what did he do? He went and made a golden ephod for $1.2 million and, and then kicked back like a king. David, awesome, awesome, awesome guy. At the pinnacle of his career, God made him the most successful king ever. And when did he fall? When he was feeling good and self-righteous. Uh, you see it everywhere. It happens in ministries that are big and on TV, and you see them, and they just... I've seen ministries that really, really, really started hungry after God. And after they got to a certain point, whether it be local or whether it be TV or whether, whatever, you see they really did have roots to start right. And then once they got to a certain point, it wasn't all about God anymore. It's about the glory that I'm getting out of this and how much money I can make and who will look at me and think I'm awesome. And uh, what you've got to realize, you, you see that and you can say, you're doing right, I see it all the time. But now bring it home. It creeps into your life. A lot of times, uh, the things that we do actually see God accomplish through us, I hope you'll listen. Because I'll be honest, I have to pray about this all the time and ask God to let me see my own heart. A lot of the things we do get accomplished for God and the whole world thinks wonderful. When we stand before God, and he looks at those accomplishments at the Bema seat when we're going to be judged to be rewarded. A lot of the wonderful, righteous things that you did will be burned away. And you're going to stand there and say, what? Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.13. Each one's works will become clear for the day, the day of the Bema seat, will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's works of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Um, if what you're doing for God is not an attempt from the bottom of your heart, this is where prayer time, this is where drawing close to God counts. Because you can't do it on your own. It'll just happen. If what you're doing for God is not an attempt to just be his humble servant and to please him and glorify him. If everything you're doing doesn't have that motivation where you're walking so close with him, everything you say is, God, I just want to be where you are. I just want to be one with you. I don't care what we do or where you take me or how hard or how easy it is or how big or how small it is. If I could just know that it's really what you want and it's going to bring you glory in the way you meant, take me there. Let's do it. And then if you give a cup of cold water, you will get great reward because your goal was to serve him. But if it comes down to it wasn't big enough, I didn't do enough, I didn't get enough recognition, or your whole motivation for getting into it was to be looked at before you started, or after it happened, you felt like you were doing it for God, but then you felt all let down because nobody shook your hand, patted you on the back, which I see all the time. It's the number one reason people quit after they start volunteering. They didn't get enough praise. Sometimes, and yet my personality, you guys know me. My wife says, you just look for something good to say about everybody. I'm like, honey, it, it's, it's real. People have 
good things about them, and they don't hear it enough. And I want to tell you because you, you need to hear it. But I'll sometimes withhold, and it's so hard for me. I'll withhold a compliment when somebody does something, and it's hard because I don't want to ruin them. And then I'll see if you're going to stick around. Fourth or fifth time, maybe I'll start patting you on the back. Otherwise, I was just testing your butt. Let's see how you do. <laughs> it's biblical. Uh, but if you don't do it for that reason, if you don't do it for that reason, if you don't do it for that reason, he doesn't need or want your service. Because he can do it by himself without any of us. And he can do it with somebody else. The only reason he's using us is why. I've told you a million times. So that he can get the glory in our lives. We can see that he did it. So that he can draw close to us. And so he can teach our heart to care and sacrifice as his. That's why he uses you. It's the only reason he uses you. He doesn't need you. So if you're not doing it for those reasons, it's not going to count. So just let your heart be focused on striving to lift his name. Striving to be close to him. Striving to be where he is no matter what it is. Big or small. And then here's the last thing. I just want to say this. We'll take it one step deeper. How many people in here, we spiritually have all of his word. We have his word all around us. We spiritually have the right to be in this church and worship him without any interruptions or worries. Somebody's going to come in with an AK-47, right? How many people in this church right here, right now, are more materially blessed than most people in all of mankind's history and in anywhere in the world right now? And yet we sit on it and we're so used to it. Nothing's ever enough. And no matter what we have, we're upset about that one stinking thing we don't have. And we don't have a car as new as somebody. You've got no idea how completely king, queen, blessed every one of you and myself are. And then you have no idea... Of the freedoms that we are so used to. We move where we want. We do what we want. We work where we want. We say what we want. No matter who it hurts. Nobody can do anything. Because we got freedom. And we take our material freedom. And our spiritual freedom. And all of our liberties. And we act like idiots. We act like Samson. Who was blessed and anointed of God. Above everyone in his nation. He was blessed and anointed for a purpose. You have spiritual and material blessings. And liberties like no one ever has. And you use every bit of it. And you live like Samson for self. Very often. And I do too. We've got to understand. You don't have to feel guilty about the blessings we have. But what you do need to do is realize. Look at my life. Look what he has given me that I've had my whole life and just don't realize how blessed I am because I live behind the walls of the United States of America. And praise God that you have been anointed, blessed, and set free as you have. And then in servitude, not out of guilt, but in you are so good and so awesome, let me be a blessing back. Let me use the anointing and freedoms and blessings that you have given me and let me use them to serve you. Because that's why you gave it to me. That's how you honor God. It starts by stopping right where we are. And just taking note of what we've got. And being so overwhelmed at our anointing from God. That we will use it for him instead of for ourselves. Because if we continue to live like most of us do as Christians. We're just like Samson. 100%. We're anointed, blessed, set free. And we're using every bit of it for us. So before we go getting too hard on him in the pages to come, we need to search our own hearts. Now, I hope that made sense. All right. I know, too long. Let's stand for prayer. I tried to find the most uncomfortable seats I could so you will never doze off again. How to do? This was an introduction to Samson. Was it not some of the most awesome stuff? God's word is real. When you find stuff in a simple passage like that, that's that powerful. And that revealing of the mystery, one piece of the mystery that that man shouldn't have known about, that was long ways away, and we just catch little pieces of the mystery that show that God was dropping nuggets and only God could have done it. Every time you open the book, you find his fingerprint and you find Jesus. And that's why he's my God. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we praise you for your goodness, praise you for your love, your long-suffering, for your creativity, for your wit, for your imagination. God, you are awesome. 
Let us see you with all the personality. You're not stoic. Let us see you with all the personality and the richness. Let us know you want to razzle dazzle us. You want to show us who you are and how you think and what you're about. You want us to see your creativity and your secrets and your mysteries that only the Spirit can reveal. Lord, help us be thankful for what you've done for us and the anointing you've given to us. And Lord, more than that, let everybody in here, starting with me, realize the anointing that you still have waiting. And all we have to do is realize you want it. You want to give us oneness with you. You want to use us more. You just want us to desire nothing but to be used, and it's ours. Help me see that more and more. Let this church learn it until you set us on fire and you do things with us we never dreamed, and you can, and you're waiting. Let us answer the call in Jesus Christ's precious name. And they all said, Amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory
Say that.